Welcome to the podcast. We're living indeed in turbulent times as we grapple with global pandemic, systemic racism, high unemployment, and of course, a recession. So why, did, why is it important to talk about an abstract idea like pluralism? It's important because pluralism refers to the respect for human diversity, the understanding that human differences are a source of common good and not of division. But we certainly have our work cut out for us, both in Canada and in the world, seeing that the promotion of pluralism requires many actors to come together and it requires legal reform. But most of all, it requires a change in our hearts and minds. Yeah, Senator, we do certainly live in turbulent times. And, and you know, this isn't the first time that Canada has faced difficult situations. Uh, we had a fantastic guest on this podcast, uh, former Prime Minister Joe Clark. Um, and he really, you know, had a great conversation about pluralism, about the situation Canada is facing right now. But we also delved deep into the past, you know, during his time as Prime Minister, as Secretary of State for External Affairs. And we had a you know really interesting conversation, I thought, to be honest, about you know what he did and what Canada did to mobilize the world community to tackle apartheid in South Africa. And he talked about what they did and what we can learn and, and use as we go forward to tackle these most pressing issues. So I think we should go to the interview. Today we are talking about pluralism. And I have personally always thought of pluralism as an antidote, a vaccination against the rampant disease of populism. Uh, and our guest today is, is uniquely suited to reflect on this theme, not just as a social movement, but also as a political uh, movement that he has been part of. Our guest is no other than the Right Honorable Joe Clark. Mr. Clark served as Prime Minister of Canada from June 1979 to March 1980, the youngest person ever to hold that post. He was elected eight times to the House of Commons, becoming one of the most distinguished secretaries of state for external affairs, affairs in Canadian history, and later serving as the Minister of Constitutional Affairs. Today, he sits on too many boards and foundations to name, but let me simply surmise by saying that he continues to promote democracy and respect for human diversity. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us, Prime Minister. Great pleasure, thank you. So let's start with language, because language shapes ideas. How do you define pluralism and how is it different from multiculturalism? Or are, is it the same? Is it new wine, old wine, new bottles, or is it new wine? No, they're very much related, but it seems to me that uh, multiculturalism has to do with a respect for diversity, for difference. Pluralism is much more about a sense of community and a community which embraces uh, diversity. Uh, and uh, But the definitional questions are really tough because um, pluralism is not a, a concept or a word that jumps uh, mm -hmm. to the mind of, uh, of a lot of people, even though they're directly affected by it. And one of our challenges, I think, is to uh, get a, a better working model or working idea of what pluralism is about. I think that's actually, you know, the way you described it as multiculturalism is respect, um, but pluralism is more of a societal movement. It's, it's an interesting thought that, you know, we should explore further because there are say, critics. I, I'm very interested in the idea of community. I think that we uh, we under undervalue uh, the importance of community, and I think that that is a consequence to some degree of the modern age in which we all have so many communities, some of them at a distance. Uh, but the concept of community, I think, requires uh, much more attention as we go forward in an age that is atomizing. Communities are the opposite of atomizing. That's an interesting way of putting it. So since you're talking about communities. Uh, let's talk about the growing communities of conflict and turmoil in the world. Given what we're seeing all around us, I don't need to name the jurisdictions, but we're all familiar with them. 
Why is the conversation about pluralism particularly important today? Because when uh, most of us began to, most of, most of us who think of ourselves as pluralism, as pluralists, when we began to think about pluralism, we assumed that it was uh, a self-evident virtue and that uh, all we had to do was investigate it and, uh, and identify it. I think that there is uh, now some question as to how self-evident uh, it is and uh, other forces are arising. So those of us who believe in pluralism have got to work particularly hard to, uh, uh, on the one hand, define it, but uh, on the other hand, extol, identify and extol its virtues. Uh, and that's, um, that's going to be a, uh, a real task. In effect, what we've dis the conclusion to which we've come in the, uh, in the awards jury upon which we both serve is that we are more likely to succeed in demonstrating pluralism than we are in defining it. Uh, and um, that can itself be limiting because uh, each definition is specific. But when we look at them together, we recognize that we are talking about a commonality of respect and again of community. So interesting. So form will follow function in a way. So the definition may well arise from its demonstrated uh, um, action on the ground as opposed to, you know, I find that interesting. And we'll talk about that a little later when we talk about okay. the globalism, the Center for Pluralism's award program that you and I both sit uh, on the jury of. But let's veer into the realm of politics, your old life, you know, and I'm always very proud as a Canadian when I cite the leadership that Canada took under the prime un, under Prime Minister Brian Mulroney and with you as uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs on the stand against apartheid in South Africa. What lessons are there from that political discussion, uh, uh, you know, with Prime Minister Thatcher and others around the table who were, I understand, initially reluctant to President Reagan, but in the end, everybody came together. What lessons are there for pluralism and human rights and peace that can be drawn from that experience? Well, it, I, thank you for the question. I think it's a very uh, interesting factor for us to, to consider because the, the what defined Canada's approach to the apartheid issue uh, was that it was an action that we took. It was not simply a position that we took. Uh, we actually wanted to uh, help change things. We knew that we would not be the driving force in change. We're not a great power. And at the end of the day, though there is great interest in the issues involved in apartheid, it is an issue, it was, is an issue in South Africa. Uh, and all we could do, in effect, was uh, uh, was influence it. And so that led to the approach that we uh, we took. Uh, for example, uh, there was a fairly strong view that we should close our embassy. Uh, I deliberately declined to close the embassy. I believe that embassies uh, should be open uh, almost everywhere. I think that they are a a, uh, a source of gathering information and, uh, and presence. The, the, in French, they say the absent are always wrong. And uh, I think that there is uh, uh, an important uh, factor here. We also, and again, there was controversy about this, we staged our sanctions. Uh, rather than uh, trying to uh, drive them in all at once, and as important as anything else, this is a Canadian context, but nonetheless, we'll be talking about Canada and pluralism. We used our unique capacity in the world to gather others together and to establish some kind of common purpose uh, to um, maximize the impact of several voices and to organize a lot of the smaller voices, the voices of smaller countries in the world. Uh, we, that took the form. It was a Commonwealth initiative, but we and Australia were on the one hand the, prim the prominent funders, but we were also in effect uh, the leaders of it. That Commonwealth Committee of Foreign Ministers on Southern Africa 
uh, was designed to aggregate uh, the impact that um, uh, that we had. And I should say that in the um, in that campaign, we maintained as open as relations as we could with the government of South Africa. Uh, because at the end of the day, it was going to be easier for us to uh, encourage some changes in that way than otherwise. Our principal uh, allies, in fact, were uh, people on the ground. Uh, we, the, the committee I chaired, I remember in our first meeting in Zambia, we literally had to smuggle out uh, people from, uh, from South Africa to provide uh, a compelling first person witness account to uh, ministers, ministers of other Commonwealth countries who would have known these things from a briefing book, but mm -hmm. did not understand the human dimensions as as much as we uh, as much as we could, and um, uh, that combination of approaches, I think, uh, allowed us to uh, uh, to facilitate um, facilitate a change. It's interesting. The allies we worked with, one of our principal allies there was Kosatu the uh, South African Trade Union and uh, a progressive conservative, even a progressive conservative government from Canada would not have had direct access to the trade union movement, but the Canadian Labour Congress did. And uh, we worked very closely with the Canadian Labour Congress in establishing relations with COSATU and with other comparable kinds of organizations where a government might not normally have that kind of influence, uh, but we were able uh, working with others with legitimacy on the ground and on the issue uh, to uh, to accomplish things. I'm interested in the model uh, as to whether that can apply uh, can apply in the future. And I think that um, that was a long time ago. I mean, in terms of contemporary politics, and I'm not sure there is enough attention to the mechanics of uh, that's yeah the mechanics of how that worked uh, because um, it was. Um, Again, not to dwell too long on the past, we tried two or three things. We sent in, we, the Commonwealth, sent in a, a group of eminent persons uh, and uh, hoped that some of the traditional uh, public influence of people who were prominent in other countries or in churches would have an impact upon opinion. Uh, it uh, did, but not on the opinion of the government. And we then had to come to, uh, uh, to a different approach. It almost sounds as if you wrote the playbook uh, on how to engage as a middle power, convening, what? funding, reaching out to uh, unusual stakeholders, in your case, the trade union. I certainly hope there is somewhere in someone's institutional memory at the Global Affairs Department, some of this playbook has been codified and, and referred to. I would I would think in these days of turmoil, uh, you know, uh, being being practical, uh, as the way you were, uh, should resonate. But so it wasn't, wasn't just practicality. We, mm -hmm. we also took, exam took advantage of uh, uh, an institutional arrangement, almost a family arrangement, the family of the Commonwealth, uh, mm -hmm. that had, whose influence on its members had been declining, probably continues to decline, but it was declining even at that point. But we had uh, issues in common. We had legacy issues. We had historic issues, and we were able, uh, and again, Canada and Australia played major roles. The role of the Commonwealth uh, Secretariat was extraordinary. Sonny Ramfo was the uh, Secretary General at the time. And, um, uh, and, and among us, we were able to get almost all of the members of the, uh, uh, the Commonwealth, not only to uh, agree to sit around the table, but actually to take coordinated actions. It seems so, one of the things that that you're, you, one of the lessons to be learned and from, from your example, Prime Minister, is that, you know, and I'm, I'm curious to hear your, your opinion about this, but it seems to me that leadership was one of the shining lights there, either Canada's leadership, your leadership, the Prime Minister Mulroney's at the time leadership as well. Um, and, and so I'm wondering what your opinion is, you know, thinking about pluralism, thinking about divided communities and societies that we have uh, a little bit in Canada, in other parts of the world, what role does leadership play in a positive force or in maybe a negative force too that continue, that may, 
you know, uh, may divide societies and, 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 and make conflict between various groups. Well, leadership is, uh, is essential. The question is, how is it manifest and uh, what can it be done? What can be done? And one of the things, one of the reasons we uh, uh, settled on, settled on, one of the reasons we decided to act together as a community of nations in the Commonwealth was that none of us, frankly, had the influence to change this by ourselves. Probably Canada had more influence than others. We were a member, of, an active member. Uh, under Mr. Mulroney, an assertive member uh, of the of the G7 and uh, and others, but uh, we knew what our relative standing was in the world, and we knew that uh, there were others whom we uh, we had to draw in. Um, I think it was time uh, it was time for some group of um, who were more than simply advocates uh, to become engaged in this issue, uh, and. Um, and obviously, the um, uh, the role of the African National Congress was key. An interesting sideline that may be quite illustrative of how these things are all connected. I was in South Africa again in September of last year, almost uh, a year ago. I was there as part of Canada's campaign for the uh, Security Council seat. And I had an opportunity to meet uh, uh, President Ramaphosa, uh, a long meeting, a longer than I, longer than I had anticipated. On the way out, he said to me, uh, "You, I had uh, worked closely with um, the a the African National Congress in exile," uh, and he said, uh, "One of the things that I note as president of South Africa now is how well educated they were," and he said they had to be well educated because they were in places like Tokyo and London and elsewhere, where there was great skepticism about the cause of the ANC, and they needed to be able to, uh, uh, to match that capacity. And it's interesting in terms of legacies and governments. He, Ramaphosa, with all the problems South Africa has faced, is preoccupied with the question of education in his own country now, that the standards that really helped them make such a profound difference in that era are not as um, as prominent there. So leadership is a is a um, is a continuing uh, element asset in uh, in all of these uh, these issues. So, Prime Minister, you and I are connected in different ways. You know, we cross paths on the hill, but we are now more intimately connected because we're both on the jury of the Glo Global Pluralism Award. For those who are of my listeners today who are unfamiliar with this award, it is presented once every two years to individuals, organizations, governments, and businesses of any nationality anywhere in the world who are contributing in a real felt way to building societies where diversity, human diversity is respected and valued. Recipients receive $50,000 to further their, their work in support of pluralism. So you've been doing this, I think, for three years. I'm new at it, but you've been doing it for three years. Can you share with us an example, one or two examples of the winners who really spoke through their work to this concept of pluralism? Let's make it well, real for our listeners. Well, then that's exactly the point. We talked earlier about defining pluralism. It, it's almost impossible to define beyond the interested. And we have to move beyond people who are living with the consequences or absence of pluralism uh, and not simply its, its advocates. Pluralism does two things. The, among the things pluralism does are two. One, it clearly changes attitudes. Uh, if it is enforced, it changes attitudes. The second is that it opens possibilities that were simply not uh, present before. And that was clear in a number of the, uh, the award winners. It was clear, in fact, you will find when we sit down to take a look at the applications that are coming in, there are amazing stories from amazing places uh, around the world. There is a consistency to uh, inventiveness and to uh, applied goodwill. But a couple of them, one from the last um, series, was a group of teachers in the Balkans uh, who were all uh, teaching the history of their particular country as the country wanted it to be believed. They were teachers. And so they had come together and they were in effect self-editing uh, so that they could um, uh, 
reflect the truth better than the myth did, than the national myth did. They call themselves learning history that is not yet history. Uh, and uh, these are people who live in regimes that are not always easy. Uh, they are in effect employed by the public, so they have to be careful as to what they're doing. They are nonetheless uh, having a very real impact upon uh, uh, upon public policy uh, in their place, and they're showing courage, and they are getting the truth out, and they are helping people connect with uh, not only their very particular roots, but their regional roots on the one hand, but also on their human roots. It's um, an act of, it's not simply a single act of courage. It's a, it's a, it's, it's collective courage. Uh, and collective courage on the part of people who, in effect, have a lot to lose uh, because they are dependent upon state salaries. They have families that are all of this kind mm. of thing. That's one example of, uh, of, of changing information, changing attitudes. One of the first winners in the first round was an extraordinary woman named Alice Nidaritu from, uh, from Kenya, who is a, um, uh, a conciliator, a mediator, uh, but she is a woman and uh, she is mediating conflicts in extraordinarily male dominated societies. And she is, as anyone who meets her knows, just a magnetic and a very effective person, not least because she's a storyteller. Uh, she understands the stories of the people with whom she's dealing and she's able to uh, to respond to their stories with stories from their own culture of her own that uh, that make a difference. There was an interesting critical story that she discusses, she mentioned. Um, she was a team, one of a team of three mediators. The other two were men. Uh, after the first couple of mediations, uh, one of the men to her said to her, look, these tribal elders are not going to listen to a woman. Uh, however, they will listen to a chair. So you are going to be the chair of our group. And she went in and they were right. Uh, they listened to the chair. And once she got going, once she had their attention, uh, once she had proven that she was more than a caricature, uh, she was able to make a, a very substantial difference. She understood that. Uh, she understood that uh, it was a to replicate and needs to be told. And she is an extraordinary uh, role model um, in the world. These aren't all simply um, instant instances of humans doing extraordinary things. Some of them are also, one of them in particular that struck me being as expert as you are in technology, Senator, uh, had to do with uh, a technical uh, device created by some young people in uh, Brazil that translates spoken language to sign language so that the deaf can be brought into conversations. And it's a little device and it's by techies. It's by the sort of people you think would not have much interest in this sort of thing. But they did it not to sell it, but to help the deaf take a fuller part in society uh, and particularly in relatively in societies that are challenged. So these sorts of things you will find when we sit down and look at the applications, these sorts of things are going on around the world in all sorts of, uh, of places. Uh, they're not foreign stories. They're very deeply rooted in very specific and often closed communities. And they demonstrate that pluralism, the potential for pluralism is alive and well. The question is, how do we recognize it? How do we mobilize it? So I, I really take, take to what you're saying about the narrative, the storytelling, and finding points of light and connecting them across their difference, because there's a huge amount of difference in the teachers in Kosovo and the app developers, developers in Brazil, but they are connected uh, through humanity, I think, and that yeah. is the story. Let's shift focus to Canada. Mm -hmm. You know, we like to think of ourselves as a pluralistic society, uh, a multicultural society, a diverse society, uh, and yet, in the last four to five months, we have seen discussions, uh, demonstrations, outrage over police brutality and systemic racism in our country. So when you when you look at this, you know, we we put ourselves out in this way, and yet there is a reality on the ground in the other. Um, how do you think Canada is Canada is doing on, in moving 
to a truer form of pluralism than we currently have. I mean, pluralism, I think, is not an is not a destination. It's always going to be a journey. It always is. So Canada's on that journey. So what do you think Canada needs to pay attention to uh, to address the fairly uh, extreme issues of racism that that are finally being spoken of today? First, I think we have to recognize our, I was going to say values, our value as a, our potential value as a community. Uh, for a, a number of reasons, uh, some of them good luck, uh, some of them opportunity, uh, we have greater capacity to practice and respect pluralism than almost any other country. That isn't to say uh, that it is beyond the reach of teachers in Kosovo. Uh, but it is uh, it is more natural, and indeed, with obvious exceptions, it has been a fairly common part of our history. We are a, I've used the phrase before in Canada, contentiously sometimes, uh, that we are a community of communities, that we have uh, drawn together people who, who are very proud of who they come from, but recognize that their pride and capacity is not exclusive, and that, uh, that we together now, having said all that about our capacity, that capacity, I think, imposes an obligation upon us. Uh, we have to be, as we sometimes have been, in the forefront of change. Among other things, we're a wealthy country uh, relative to a lot of others. Something else that we haven't uh, explored perhaps enough is that there is a dimension to multiculturalism that can allow us to be more influential in countries of origin of so many of our, our yeah. citizens. So, uh, than, than, than other countries. And uh, that is among the Canadian assets. Now, our performance. Obviously, while the current controversies are, uh, are critically important, our major challenge, because it, it, it is so acute and it's been for, here for so long, has to do with our indigenous people. And the, the challenge of breaking caricatures on both sides uh, of the indigenous divide are, are very real. And uh, we're a little episodic in the way that we looked at it. There have been two or three occasions in my recollection when we, we looked very seriously at it. And there was a, a real determination to try to, uh, uh, to achieve change. Uh, I think that's slacking off now, in part because um, this, is, um, this is a time, the attitudes are more conflictual than they are aspirational now in Canada and in the uh, uh, and in the world. Uh, but we have to. That is one thing we have to deal with. Secondly, um, there is no question that there has been uh, across a, a wide range of, uh, of Canadian communities there has been consistent uh, prejudice and racism and racism and doubt. Uh, it would be very interesting to get a generational picture of this. It would be interesting to know uh, what kids in grade school. Uh, in Canada think about this, particularly since so many of the grade schools now are so much more diverse in their content uh, and in their languages and attitudes than, than we were before. This again speaks to, to potential, but we have to, um, uh, and if I may go back to South Africa for a second, our experience in South Africa, we have to ensure that there is always an opportunity open, an active opportunity open for dialogue among people who suffer prejudice and people who practice it. And uh, that is easier to phrase than it is to do, but it's certainly not impossible to do. And uh, one of the things we want to be careful of is that we not, is in Canada, that we not divide into uh, camps that become more and more conflictual. And that's particularly important now in an age and conflict is much more uh, the rule. You know, we've spoke earlier about pluralism. There was a time when, when pluralism, when the center was first started, there was a sort of a general assumption among those who, of us who believed in it, that this was the wave of the future. Uh, and that's a hope now, rather than an observation, uh, because there is so much evidence of so much conflict, so much anti-pluralist behavior in the world. Uh, that uh, we we have to make sure that where that concept had deep roots, those roots are kept refreshed 
uh, including in a country like Canada. Uh, but we are going to uh, suffer from some of the uh, the conflicts that uh, that we are we are suffering from these conflicts. Some of them are going to get worse. We have to have as broad an approach to it as uh, as we can. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit more about what needs to be done in Canada. I have worked for a very long time on issues of inclusion. Uh, I've I've said diversity is a is a mere demographic feature. It's interesting, but nothing more than that. It is really the the intentional path to inclusion that is the challenge mm. for us. And study upon study has re revealed that the people who lead our country. You know, let's whittle it down to directors and corporations, directors of charities, directors in our public institutions sort of by and large still reflect and there is little evidence that we can aggregate. So evidence is important, still reflect the old Canada. And uh, you know, you you're on a lot of boards and foundations and committees. Uh, do you, in, in these instances, is there a conversation uh, that is had about becoming a, more open, about inviting new people uh, to the table? Is it a conscious uh, and intentional conversation or is it uh, sort of a conversation we need, you know, someone who ticks off this box and this box and then we're done with diversity? I'm just curious about that. The answer would be both, uh, obviously, but there are certainly some boards on which I set, which uh, in which I have raised the question. You wouldn't be surprised uh, without avail. Uh, there has not been much. And there are others where um, uh, there is a real determination to reflect diversity. It started, I have to say, with diversity, with uh, with gender, uh, mm -hmm. because um, uh, at least in the corporate world, um, uh, there may not have been an expectation for uh, our cultural diversity. There was a growing expectation for gender diversity. It began with that, but it's spread beyond that now, I think. Uh, I have to say that um, <laughs> may say more about the kinds of companies that invite me to be a director uh, than it does about uh, uh, corporations generally, but those issues are there. There's a related issue we have to deal with, and that is the the advantages, disadvantages of quotas, uh, and of and of establishing uh, criteria that um, uh, make sense from the perspective of justice, but uh, uh, require some work to to use a a neutral uh, a neutral mm -hmm. phrase. Uh, I think now there is again. I go back. To, I have two grandchildren in, in school, and I am amazed as I listen to them and to their attitudes uh, at how much more aware of issues like diversity, much more aware of the world general, but particularly issues of diversity, they are. Uh, and in their cases, it's uh, as much as their circumstances allow, it is not simply their learning in school, it is it is something they, uh, they, they genuinely believe. So there may be some changes here, uh, but there, obviously this is an issue we have to deal with. May I switch to something else without changing Absolutely. the subject? But, and, and because it's, uh, we've been talking about social distancing uh, since uh, COVID arose. I think one of the great revelations of COVID around the world was how much distance there is between, call them the privileged and call them the rest, uh, that we just did not recognize. And it, it is in effect, an opportunity for us. There is a moment uh, to to consider the imp the sources and the implications of the social distancing that we're finding. It comes up in particular questions. It comes up in the questions of uh, how has the treatment of senior citizens led to so much carelessness or abuse. But there's a general issue here as to uh, whether we see beyond ourselves as much. First of all, as much as we have to, but secondly, whether we see beyond ourselves as much as we have in the past, because one of the things that uh, has happened with the with the modern age is that while our range of vision, we know more about what is happening in the world, 
But we are also inclined to focus on interests of our own, focus on those interests much more exclusively uh, than we had before. And there is an opportunity here, I think, in this concept of addressing the social distancing that an international health crisis has revealed in terms of uh, of informing our own actions. And it's not all about health. It's not all about it. It is it is very much a we have had a light shone on our failures uh, and they're not failures we can blame upon somebody else in every case. Uh, there are uh, uh, these are failures that um, uh, that a lot of us one way or another own uh, and they're 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 dangerous. Uh, so what are we going to do about them? I think that there's an interesting uh, debate to be done here, to, to, to be had here. I'm only raising it, but it is it is very much uh, of a part with the discussion about pluralism. That's fascinating, and it, it, it leads me quite naturally to my next question, back to politics. You use the word debate. We go back, Parliament reopens, and we will have debates about what went right, what went wrong, what we could have done better. It's a minority government. You were the prime minister for minority government, and in some ways, I think minority governments are pluralist because they need to listen to all voices. They cannot hold power without negotiating uh, concessions and, and deals and moving in a different way forward. And sometimes minority governments have done the best work for our country and other countries. Can you draw from some of your own experiences from that time and reflect on the need and the urgency for pluralism and politics today? I can because uh, this has been a preoccupation of mine in a very particular way for a long time. And it has to do with the inclusive nature of national political parties. Uh, and there was a time in the country uh, in the 70s and the 80s when all three of the national political parties while they had their different views were very much reached out to to large communities now none does uh, and it's quite interesting it has to do with um, uh, with a multitude of changes but one of them is that um, uh, people are being addressed through their interests uh, more than they were, uh, more than they are through their communities. I guess is is one of the ways to uh, uh, to put this. I grew up in a political party. Uh, I learned about my country, including its diversity, primarily through a political party, because people who uh, said they were in the same organization as I was were very different from me. And uh, rather than say, "You guys are different, go away," I had to sit down and say, "We are together. What do we have in common?" And that was an attitude that I think permeated for a long time. Now, with the uh, the exclusivity of focus upon quote, people like us uh, in in each of the three uh, political parties, we are left without at the center of our political system. We are left without that example of differences working together, that of being a community in effect, of being a political family. And I think that is a challenge of, uh, of modern society. It shows up institutionally. There's a separate question about uh, parliamentary reform. Uh, Parliament, Parliament's actions always lag by 10 or 20 years uh, behind the society. I mean, you're in the middle of a very interesting yep. city yep. in a very interesting um, uh, experiment. Uh, and. Uh, I haven't looked closely enough at it, and I'm not asking you to comment on it now, but I think it is going to be quite interesting to see whether um, what has been gained, underlying gained, and what has been lost, underlying lost, uh, by the 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 uh, changes in the method of bringing people to the to the Senate of Canada, uh, and um, uh, some of the gains are quite clear. Uh, some of the uh, uh, it's not simply the losses. If there are losses, the reasons for the loss, and whether the reasons uh, have uh, have moved us away from a de facto appreciation for pluralism in its uh, in its breadth. Uh, but I think these are really important questions, and I think that in an in a sense, the uh, the crisis has uh, presented us with an opportunity to recognizing that. Uh, uh, social distancing 
is not just a health precaution. Social distancing is a description of what we have been doing with increasing velocity uh, for um, increasing velocity in some fields uh, for several years. One of the things that that I, I think is interesting that you mentioned that is Canada often thinks of themselves as you know we often compare ourselves to our southern neighbor and do we have you know different issues uh, you know uh, between different ethnic groups and that sort of thing. We always think that we're there, we're much better, but one thing that is interesting you talk about COVID and and the pandemic. Uh, but one thing that is is interesting about that uh, to build off what you were talking about is that Canada doesn't actually accumulate any uh, race-based data, right? So you have mm-hmm. you have certain uh, groups that were maybe more hurt than others during COVID for a variety of other reasons, but we don't really know that. And and you know just now we're starting to to track data for corporations when it comes to their diversity plans. There's no tracking of data for um, uh, charities and 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 that sort of thing for, for their governance structures. So I'm just curious: is, is it time that we start to finally collect the data that is necessary and not be so shy uh, about you know talking about you know race and and talking about the differences between race, so we can actually then maybe you know as you said you know deal with people in communities rather than just you know people that are all of a common nature. Well, I'll, I'll fudge on that and I'll say it may well be, but what is certainly the case is that uh, we've recognized that there are many more differences uh, than we had anticipated. Uh, and uh, we we have to understand uh, what they are and why they existed and then what we can do about it. Uh, and I, one of the things I lament about modern Canada, contemporary Canada, uh, is that um, I can recall a time when there was much more public debate about these kinds of things. Um, I, as you know, in one of the unsuccessful, in one in terms of results, aspects of my career, chaired a constitutional process that, uh, among other things, encouraged a series of uh, then closely televised but highly representative discussions uh, of uh, aspects of the Canadian Constitution. And it wasn't about the law; it was about the nature of the, the forces that create the uh, the community. Now, that uh, and I have to say that that um, exercise in consultation, admittedly a consultation among leaders, but nonetheless leaders that represented a broad constituency, that did result in a unanimous agreement on a constitutional practice. Now it was unpopular, and when it went to referendum for a yeah. variety of reasons. It was defeated, but the example is interesting. We we do longer have royal commissions. Uh, royal commissions used to play that kind of role. They again were elitist. That was the problem with them. They were sometimes elitist with a sort of a with an insert. Uh, there was a Ukrainian Canadian, for example, on the on the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism back back in the day. But um, uh, nonetheless, they were contemplative, relatively independent uh, discussions of major public issues and uh, open to the public. Whether or not they included the public is a different. Anyway, I think these are all. Uh, we have been faced to. We have been forced to face the future, and uh, these are all aspects of the future that we had not recognized a year ago. Uh, and we tend to lament the challenges we have to face with good reason, but we should be looking at some of them as real opportunities for uh, as real opportunities. And running through the opportunities is precisely what uh, is precisely the question of pluralism. So we're coming to the end of our conversation. I could talk to you forever, but we do have time limitations. So I want to get back to the Global Award for Pluralism. How do individuals and organizations apply? What's the process of selecting the winners? And what difference has winning an award meant uh, for the people on the ground who are involved in leading these efforts? Let me take the last one first. The impact I think is quite extraordinary because these are people who had generally operated only uh, under a small light and are now operating under a much larger light uh, there was an extraordinary winner in um, Colombia who, uh, whose family had been murdered. Uh, members of his family had been murdered uh, 
uh, by one of the gangs there, and his own family had murdered uh, members of the other gangs, and they were living in a in a village on the on the coast that uh, had was not at all a rich village, and he decided that uh, there was enough of history that they had to bring people together, uh, and he did it. And uh, who knows how many other communities in Colombia where that was happening, but it happened in his, he did something about it, he received an award, he is now quite well known among the communities that are comfortable in, uh, in his. Uh, so this is a movement that can, uh, you said earlier that this is easier to demonstrate than to define, but the demonstrations are particularly powerful within uh, groups that are um, that are comparable to the to the winners. The applications, uh, there is a formal process for applications, and the center is working as hard as it can be to can to uh, uh, to broaden that. There's also a formal provision for nominations, and we have to work on broadening the range of people who feel um, who are prepared to uh, to nominate. It's quite broad now and it is improving as everything is as so many things are uh, once they uh, once they get started and I forget your first question uh, how do people apply but perhaps we can put this information in in the body of the podcast sure. because I know people are going to be interested to apply yes. after they uh, after this podcast. So once again, Prime Minister, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us today. I'd also like to thank our listeners. Uh, be sure to check out our podcasts and I invite you to suggest topics and speakers to us. On our part, we will continue to move the needle as we speak to people, wise people, thoughtful people who show us the path forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.